Hey, Mark, it's Bill Horowood at the Kennedy Space Center. It's uh, great to chat with you today. How you doing? Hey, Bill, great to hear your voice. Yeah, for sure. Well, listen, I've only got five minutes, so I'm just going to jump in with some questions, if that's okay. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks are interested in your flight because you're taking off without knowing for sure when you're coming home. So first of all, if something falls through with the crew of the next Soyuz this fall, would you come home then, or is the plan right now to keep you up for – you know, a couple of rotations so that regardless, there'd be a USOS crew member on board that entire time. Well, the plan is for me to be on board for six months. Um, of course, it's a very dynamic situation, so we try to make sure we're ready for anything. Uh, I certainly feel emotionally prepared to stay on orbit well longer than that six months that's planned. Um, there are a variety of things that could impact uh, um, when I come back. The... Uh, I, I'm also very certain that uh, regardless of what happens, we'll make sure we have a U.S. presence continuously on the space station. I understood that. Um, have you by any chance talked to Scott Kelly about uh, about his mission up there to maybe get some pointers if you do end up staying there for, for a long time? I have seen Scott Kelly after he returned from his flight, and we had lots of debriefings and got to hear how it felt for him. I, I know it was quite challenging. I... Um, I also recognize that a big part of a longer flight were it to happen would be managing your own resources, recognizing that it's not a sprint that's going to be more like a marathon. And um, you've got to be ready for an emergency to happen so you can't push yourself to the limits all the time. No, you certainly can't. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about with, with uh, uh, just recalling Kelly's flight, is there anything you've pulled out of there in terms of exercise, in terms of uh, you know, keeping yourself in shape that would that would be applicable, or is this just the standard, you know, you do what everybody does when you're on board station and do your two hours a day or, or whatever. Is there anything different if you're thinking you're taking a longer flight? No, I think it's the same. I don't know of anything that's changed. I certainly trust the exercise folks that we've got that make those plans for us to do the right thing. In fact, I think this time, based on my experience on, on my previous flight, and the amount of bone density I lost, I'm going to do a better job of flying what they tell me to do, both nutritionally and exercise-wise, to try to protect that bone density. Is that the biggest challenge to you? Is it physical or mental, do you think, is the biggest challenge for someone going into a flight like this? I'm not trying to dwell on the year. I know that's not set in stone. It's just something that I think fascinates a lot of people. I, I think, I, think at a, I can only answer that question for me personally. And I think there certainly is a physical aspect to it. I'm not as concerned about that because it's, it's just going to be what it's going to be. I think the mental part, I'm, I'm going to try to really be meditative about the time, try to focus on positive things. I, I think you could end up in a, in a, tight, in a tough spot um, if you don't recognize that it's a challenging environment. Basically, you're working inside for a year with a few very intense moments to get outside, but even then you're getting outside inside of a space suit doing a spacewalk if you yeah. get to do that. Uh, that's something else. What does your family think about it? I mean, I know military people routinely face uh, really long deployment, but, you know, this seems fairly extreme by even those standards. Uh, yeah, if, I, again, I, I'm not uh, speculating that I, I am going to go uh, to space for longer uh, yeah, than six and months. And I, under, I understand that. that. I understand that. I'm, but if you did, I'm just wondering how your family prepares for something like that. Well, we always try to uh, get ready for the worst case. So, the attitude we're taking is that uh, every step of this way means I'm just that much closer to getting home, whether that be uh, six months or longer than that. And my wife's really got a fantastic attitude. She's, she's caged her expectations. This would be, uh, I've deployed multiple times for uh, um, certainly even a year-long deployment for me, though it did involve me coming home after about nine months for vacation. That certainly won't happen if I'm, if I'm on orbit for any period of time. I don't get to come home for a vacation. So for my family, this would be a record setter, not just being away from home because of the flight, but also spending the last few months here in Russia trying to prepare for that flight. And are your, this is the last question. Are your family members going to, anybody going to be there for launch to be able to see you take off or is because of COVID is for folks staying at home? Folks are staying home. Yep. Um, oh. we, there, there may have been the option for my wife to come out to be at the launch facility we would not have been able to uh, be close to each other, so that would have been a challenge. And we just opted to avoid that. I think after not seeing her for so long, um, only being able to see her across the glass would have been almost harder than actually not seeing her at all. 
Hey, listen, I'm out of time. Mark, have a great flight. I look forward to talking to you in orbit, and uh, best of luck. Thank you, Bill. It was really great talking to you. Take care. Thank you. Colonel Vanda, hey, uh, this is uh, Tarek Malik from uh, Space.com. How do you hear me? I hear you well, Tarek. How about me? Uh, I hear you just fine. Thanks so much uh, for having some time today. Um, uh, well, uh, Colonel Mark Vanda, hey, uh, headed to the International Space Station. Um, uh, thanks so much for having some time for our questions. You know, you're uh, 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 just a, a short while out from, from headed to space. I'm just curious how you're, you're feeling right now, what you're looking forward to the most on this mission. Actually, Tarek, I'm very excited. I, uh, when, I, when it finally got formalized, I realized that I had not been allowing myself to get excited. But then when it got finalized, I uh, felt so good about it that I, I realized it's just good. Um, the thing I'm looking forward to the most about being back on the space station is the complete freedom of motion. Being able to just flip upside down, hook my feet on the ceiling, um, swing around corners, let my feet go head first into a corner and then grab onto a, a handrail and let my feet swing wide and go feet first into the next module. It's just, it can be a lot of fun if you just play around with it a little bit. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine. You know, you, you mentioned just uh, getting ready to, 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 to go. It seems like your flight came together a bit quickly uh, for, uh, for a launch in April. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering kind of how, how last minute was that? It seems like you might have an open-ended flight. Uh, uh, how do you make uh, those, those plans uh, to head to space if, if you're not sure when you're going to come back? Well, the first thing was the uh, me preparing for this flight was something that we had done as a contingency just in case we were able to, to get the seat. So I was, a, my job was to be ready to get in that seat. So even though it got announced very late, my training had continued throughout. Um, and then the possibility that we stay on orbit longer than the six months that's currently planned for me is always there. 
things change. Uh, and when we're in spacecraft, we have to coordinate with the Russians, Roscosmos in particular, to determine when we get to come back. And so their needs are part of the equation, and we got to pay attention to those. If it does end up being longer than six months, my attitude about it really is it's a, a new life experience. I haven't experienced that before, and I'm excited to try it out if it were to happen. Is there anything about the station that you're looking forward to returning to the most, uh, about just working on that, not just the, the, the range of motion being able to, to, to float in space, but um, uh, is there a certain spot that was – uh, the Van de Hey spot from your last flight that you're you're looking forward to getting back to. Well, the uh, the resistive exercise device called ARED is uh, conveniently located right in front of the window that faces down towards the Earth. So I, I've always enjoyed working out, but when I get to uh, every sit up you do, uh, you get a view of whatever place over the Earth we're passing over. That is an amazing amazing thing to see. So I'm certainly looking forward to that again. Um, Primarily, though, with the workday, I'm looking forward to the people I'll be on orbit with. It's a, a lot of folks that I'm great friends with, and I, I'm tickled pink that I get to go ahead and spend time up there with them in orbit. You'll be on the space station at, at a really interesting time for human space flight, the 60th anniversary of, of, uh, of humans in space, uh, uh, 40, 40 years since the, uh, the, the shuttle of first flew. And I, I'm wondering how... Uh, how do you hope to, to kind of, I guess, reflect or, or, or look back on, on that, that legacy of human spaceflight when you're up there with an international crew uh, uh, looking forward towards uh, uh, NASA's Artemis program to go back to the moon? Honestly, I think I'm going to try really hard to just capture the moments, to, to, to notice the things that are unique about it, do, do a better job this time of, of journaling. Um, I really enjoy taking pictures and I'm going to try to uh, do that as well. I'm also hoping to uh, call people on the ground and try to stay connected. You know, uh, about that connection, I'm curious kind of how, how you, you uh, uh, have uh, prepared your family for, for this trip. Uh, as you mentioned, you, you've been training uh, uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, I, I, want, I imagine it may be a challenge to have a, a, a traditional send-off uh, when, when you launch. Um, uh, how, how are uh, you working with the family and, make, and making sure that everyone is, is ready and uh, uh, ready to go with just a few weeks left? Well, I think it started off with when I first got the opportunity to accept this. I made sure I talked. I have adult children now, so I talked to each, my wife, my daughter, and my son separately and let them know how I was feeling about it and asked them for their input, did they, whether or not they thought I should do, uh, say yes or not. Every one of them said do it. So that was the first step. The next step was... Uh, Gauging everybody's expectations. I made sure that everybody knew the parameters, the, the full length of time I might be away, including the training time leading up to this. And I've just made sure that we communicate. In fact, one of the nice things about the previous flight was when my kids were both in college, but NASA supported us having a weekly family conference where I, my wife in Houston, my daughter in Colorado, and my son in New York, and me on the space station, were all able to talk together and that actually became a weekly thing we started doing even after the space flight. So <laughs> that's something that's really important to continue doing. Make sure you maintain those relationships in whatever way possible. Well, thank you, well, Colonel Vanahey. Hey, I, I, I would love to talk more. Uh, I'm just about out of time, but thank you so much for, for giving us kind of a preview of, of, of your flight and uh, uh, safe flights and safe landing. Thanks, Tara. It's great talking to you, too.
morning, sir. This is Sergeant Kaiser with the Richmond Recruiting Battalion. And uh, my first question for you today would be, what inspires you to ultimately join the Army? Hello, Sergeant Kaiser. I, um, in, honestly, the first thing that made me think about joining the Army was the fact that it might help me pay for college. But the reason I stayed in is I just really love serving my country, and the people I got to work with are all fantastic. Um, the sense of purpose kept me in. Awesome. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Um, I guess the follow-on to that is how did your Army service ultimately help you meet your career goals and lead you to where you are today with NASA? Gosh, it's so completely intertwined. I learned so much in the Army about working as part of a team, taking care of each other, making sure we're focused on a mission, being comfortable in, ex in extreme environments and uncomfortable situations, and all those things directly contributed to my ability to be an astronaut. I also got a lot of education opportunities through the military, uh, both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. Uh, lots of, again, training with, with equipment, learning a lot about just how to pay better attention to detail. Those kind of basic training type things we, we learn as well things that I definitely needed as a teenager. Uh, so, yeah, I can't, I can't separate the two. I would not have gotten this job if it wasn't for the Army's, uh, the Army experience that I had. Very cool, sir. Uh, I really appreciate that as well. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with that, but uh, what skills, were there any specific skills or training that you had during your Army service uh, that you currently use while training for the mission to the International um, Space Station? Gosh, I, I really, it's not a specific, uh, you know, there's so many individual skills we learn. I, I think it's really the leadership things. The Army, as, a, as leaders in the Army, we get thrown into situations where we get the challenges immediately. And we just learn in this leadership lab of experience. And we cannot get a better way to train as a leader than to live it. So... Uh, just being a person who recognizes that if you want to be a part of a really well-performing team, everybody on that team's got to trust that you know how to do your job, the decisions you're making are for the good of the rest of the team as opposed to your own personal benefit. Those are all essential parts of doing anything associated with exploration and space as well. That's great. I, I definitely feel like there's a lot of similarities between NASA and the Army in that sense for sure, sir. Um, you know, ultimately, do you have any advice for any service members who are just starting out that may wish to pursue a career later on with NASA? Yes, I would say so. A lot of times we joke in the military about never volunteering for anything, but I'd flip that. I'd say volunteer for all the hardest things. If if you're afraid you can't succeed, the only way you'll find out is if you actually try it and don't. And if you try something and you don't succeed the first time and you still want to go for it, Use that failure as a learning opportunity. Make a plan to, to understand better what to do and then go for it again. So don't accept failure as, as a, um, an outcome that's uh, something you can't overcome. And then put yourself out there. Take those risks. Don't be afraid of uh, testing your limits. Great, sir. And uh, I guess lastly is, you know, with your time in the Army, um, you know, is, are there any moments or duty stations that stand out as your uh, your best memories through serving? Uh, yes, absolutely. My very first assignment in the Army was in Vicenza, Italy, as a paratrooper in what was then the 3rd Battalion, 325th Infantry. I was a combat engineer platoon leader. And just wonderful people, a great mission. Uh, those friends that I made, uh, they're, they're, they're lifetime friends. And uh, I think also just the opportunity to work so directly with soldiers made that a really special time for me. The higher rank we get, the, 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 less opportunity, the fewer opportunities we get for that type of interaction. And uh, I, it was great. I, I feel super blessed to have lived through that. Awesome, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for taking all these questions. I greatly appreciate your time, and I wish you the best of luck uh, on your mission on April 9th, sir. Thanks, Staff Sergeant. Great talking to you. Thank you. You as well.
Hello, Mark. This is Austin, the CISO with Everyday Austin. How do you hear me? Hi, Austin. I hear you quite well. How about me? I hear you quite well. Um, last time uh, you flew, you went up on Expedition 53 and 54. That was in uh, 2017 through 2018. What are you most looking forward to as you go up to the National Space Station for your second time? Well, certainly I'm looking forward to the opportunity to uh, help, help humanity out with doing more science, learn, learn some new stuff. But uh, as far as fun-wise, I'm really looking forward to the complete freedom of motion that you get when you're in a free fall in orbit around the Earth. All right. Um, it, were there any lessons that you learned last time that you would do differently now? Uh, I learned a lot of lessons on the first month of my, first, of my flight. Uh, so by the time I left, I think I had uh, figured out things that I, I'm going to start this next first month. I'm going to hopefully do those things right away. For example, uh, eventually when I had to gather things together, I adopted something I called my uh, little toolbox or project box. Anytime I had to gather things up, instead of uh, putting them on the wall where I could accidentally bump them off of the Velcro on the wall, I started putting them on Velcro inside of a zip, lock contain a zip shut container, which dramatically reduced the frequency with which I lost stuff, which is quite frustrating the first a uh, month I was in orbit. Interesting. And uh, I asked during the press briefing about the number of people that will be up there. What do the sleeping arrangements look like with so many people on station at a time? There are some people. So normally we have a crew quarters. It's kind of a closet sized space to put a couple of your computers, so the ability to talk, talk, talk on a um, internet protocol phone, and your sleeping bag hum hung up on the wall. That some people will not have that. Uh, the, typically, the Soyuz, the Dragon crew commander sleeps inside the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, I had offered up to be one of the people sleeping outside until the population of this of the space station went down enough that I could use one of those crew quarters. But really kindly, uh, Kate Rubens, who I will be replacing on orbit, made a. a Big stand, I'm absolutely not, you are not sleeping outside, I'm going to move out. I'm, and she gave the ground controller, ground control team a whole very detailed list of all the things she wanted to make sure in place to take care of me, and I was very, very touched by that. Yeah, I, um, it, it's awesome to see all the collaboration that goes on up there. Um, I had been reading up on some of the science experiments you'll be conducting. What prior work have you had to do on Earth in order to properly prepare for some of that, or is there any? Absolutely. So I always try to describe myself more as a laboratory technician than a scientist. So my job is to make sure that I can facilitate those science experiments, which means I've got to understand how to give those science experiments the resources they need. If there's troubleshooting that has to be done, I have to understand how to operate the mechanisms to, to replace parts, for example. And a lot of times we'll have a, a primary investigator coaching us through things while they're watching over our shoulder with a video. Uh, so we've gotten exposure to a lot of things, but just enough so that I can better understand what the procedures are trying to tell me to do. It kind of establishes a common vocabulary for how to get those things done. Alrighty, and um, my final my final question here is: I know a lot of uh, there's a lot of outreach. Um, to students and to the public that you guys do while you're up on the station. Um, but before your flight, do you have any advice for any middle or high school students around the world who aspire to be an astronaut or work in other science fields like you? Absolutely. I would say uh, the very you've got to constantly choose to do challenging things, things that you enjoy, things that are going to expand your comfort zone. And in the process, you're going to find, end up doing a lot of things you're really proud of and that you really love. And then if it doesn't result in becoming an astronaut, then that's okay because you've got a fantastic life and it's, and it's going to turn out to be the, pro the process, the path that was the most important part anyway. All right, that's all for me today. I have a safe flight, a safe landing, and thank you for your service. Thanks, Austin. Great.
Very good. So we are right at 8.30 right now. So I'm going to open up the line. And, uh, Randy, uh, it's all yours. Go ahead and uh, speak to our uh, astronaut, if you would. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Randy. Nice to see that you're uh, ready for flight. I uh, am happy to report that, yes, I feel very ready for this flight. I question for you. You've been in Russia as uh, the astronaut officer's director of operations. Uh, do you speak fluent Russian? Uh, I, <laughs> it ebbs and flows. When I was here as the director of operations in Russia, it was good. It got better when I was serving as a co-pilot in uh, uh, a previous flight. And uh, in the intervening time, I'm, I'm afraid I let it fade away. But it's been coming back steadily while I've been here again. Well, that's kind of interesting. The, so actually, when it, people go into space, as you are going again, to the station, they try to speak the language of the main crew that they're meeting with. Is that correct? Uh, so, yeah, I would say the Russians speak English to us, and we try to speak Russian to the Russians. And that way we all keep it at a, very, at a simple enough level that we can understand. Some, some of the Russians speak English incredibly well, though. So uh, the nice thing about it is you can learn from each other. So, for example, if I'm trying to speak Russian to a Russian and I can't think of the right word, I can switch to English and say, hey, you know how to say this? And then they'll tell me. So we can, we can uh, tweak each other's language skills in the process of socializing. That's unbelievable. Are you going to have a special talisman in your Soyuz craft for you to signify weightlessness? You know, that is the tradition. I do have, I have no idea what that's going to be, but I'd be surprised if we don't have one. Okay. I noticed that uh, your ship is being named after Yuri Gagarin for the 60th anniversary. Quite an interesting time, isn't it? It definitely is. There's been a lot of building on these, uh, on these firsts that have happened throughout the space, throughout space flight history. I noticed that the rocket scheme that the Russians are doing, they're really going full bore on the Yuri Gagarin anniversary, having your rocket look exactly like his. I actually didn't, I didn't, I don't know anything about anything they've done to make it look like theirs. Sorry about that. I can't comment on it. How about your spacewalks? You've got several scheduled, I'm sure. And what are your thoughts on those in training? Uh, I, my, I've, done spacewalks before. I know there will be spacewalks that happen while I'm on orbit, and I'm not sure if uh, I will be one of the spacewalkers or someone who's supporting the spacewalk, but I've always felt like every single time there's a spacewalk, every single person is on the crew is part of the team that's making that a success. Yeah, Mark, you work very hard getting on this crew. You've been on the crew and off the crew and on the crew again. Um, how do you handle it psychologically? Uh, you cage your expectations. I told everybody that, hey, this is not a bad deal for me. If I don't know that I'm going to space, but I'm getting paid to, to serve in a capacity where I get to learn about how to be an astronaut or how to uh, be a member of a, a spacecraft crew, that's a good deal, even if it doesn't result in me going to space. So I just tried to keep that attitude the entire time. I didn't. I tried to make sure I didn't have any expectations. Just tried to uh, do my job, and it worked out well. I got. I realized how much I was suppressing any attachment to actually launching. Only when it was finalized, and I, for the first time, allowed myself to be really excited about it. Is your wife and uh, two children over there in Russia? No, they've been in the United States the entire time. My kids both have, uh, all three of them have jobs back in the States. So my job's here, their, their jobs are back there. Is there any one thing that you really want to get across to people when you make your flight? Oh, gosh. Um, so being, having this unique perspective on the Earth, I would say the one thing that I really would love for all of humanity to appreciate is how thin the atmosphere looks when you're looking at it relative to the size of the Earth. It looks like the Earth is this beautiful rock with just a thin varnish of air in it, on it. And when you can look down on it from outside of it, it doesn't seem like space is a separate place. 
when you look up into this into the, the night sky, especially from a desert, and you see all those stars, you're you we know we're looking into space, but we don't really perceive ourselves as standing in it. The only thing separating us from the vacuum of space is this puddle, this thin layer of air molecules. And when I was in space, I had multiple layers of a spacecraft shell that protected me from that vacuum. So it's a very precious, precious layer, and that is something that I would really love for people to, to feel like I got to feel when I saw it from space. Got it. Thank you, Mark. Godspeed for a successful flight. Thank you very much, Randy. Hi, Mark. This is Peter O'Dowd. Hey, Peter. How are you? I'm doing well. Wow, this is a really efficient schedule they have you on right now, <laughs> so we can't really chit-chat too much. I'm sorry. I'm from NPR. Good to hear you. All right. Great. Well, why don't we get started? Um, uh, thanks for joining us. This is NPR, by the way. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Absolutely. Good to be here. Yeah, and what's that trip up to the space station going to be like? Uh, I'm expecting it to be surprisingly calm. A lot of our training involves everything possible going wrong. Uh, we get trained how to respond to all that, but we very rarely get to experience what the space flight will really be like, where the spacecraft works ideally will work just fine. Um, hmm. my previous how long does it take to get up there? Uh, gosh, it takes about eight and a half minutes to actually get into orbit. For us, we'll get to the space station, if all works well, we'll get to the space station about uh, three hours after launch. So that's the way up. Uh, on the way back, you may have to give up your seat in the fall for uh, this return flight to Earth because a Russian film crew will be on the space station making a movie, which means you may not get home until the spring of 2022. Are, are you okay with that, with spending a, a full year in space? Well, I've I, I got to clarify that officially I am assigned to a six-month flight, and we, we're always ready for things to change. Uh, as you mentioned, Roscosmos um, has a, a big say in how these seats work out. So if that ends up being the case, then certainly I'm ready for that as well. My perspective on it is if I do end up staying in space for a year, that's, that's a great deal for me. I, 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 again, I'm not certain that's going to happen. But if it ended up being the, the situation I'm in, I think it's a, a new opportunity, a new life experience that I've never had before. 
Mm, I, I'll say. Uh, a few other Americans have made trips to space for over 300 days. So we have some information about what that's like, but what do you think it might do to your body if it ends up happening? Well, the biggest concern I have is my bone density. I lost a lot of it. I lost 7% of it on the previous flight. And uh, this time I'm going to try to do a better job of very carefully following the nutrition advice and the exercise advice that uh, is on the plan to try to make sure I preserve it. So that's something that my that took a while to recover. I got all that bone density back, but certainly spending more time in space, it has me uh, having an even stronger desire to do all the right things to preserve that bone density. Hmm. What do you think it would be like for, for human beings to make a, a much longer trip into space, say to Mars? I think it's going to be very challenging, physically and psychologically. We've got a lot to learn before you can do that. The uh, length of the flight will be a challenge, but you can imagine when we look at Mars right now, you can pick out this star, of course it's a planet, that looks slightly red, and that's how we identify Mars, also knowing exactly where it would be. Imagine what it would be like, though, looking back, the place where all the people you love, your entire life history before that time, looking back, and it just looks like a faint blue star out there in, the, in this vast field of other, other stars. So I think that's going to be hard for human, humans to be that far away from home. Do you think we'll do it anyway? Oh, of course. I, I absolutely believe that. Uh, we've taken lots of risks. Um, we've even crossing the Atlantic or Pacific to get to new places. Those have involved tremendous risks. We've still done them, and I'm sure we'll do them again. Mm. Well, before I let you go, what's it like to live at the International Space Station, and how do you get used to uh, it's just a very odd living environment, and not to mention just tight quarters and, and weightlessness? The uh, tight quarters wasn't really a big deal for me. It uh, certainly is an indoor job. I kind of jokingly call it a fantastic science lab in the basement with a beautiful view of the Alps uh, behind the boiler. So if you, when you get a chance to look out the window, you cannot get a better view than that spot. But it's not your normal work environment. Um, but the space station has the internal volume of a six-bedroom house. So it's, there's plenty of space. The only time it's very constrained space is for me on the trip up in that Soyuz. I'll be sitting in, a, in a, a, almost kind of a fetal position, and there's not a lot of extra space in there at all. It's a very efficient little spacecraft. Mark Vandehei, astronaut on his way to the International Space Station. Good luck. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Peter. Great talking to you today.
Carl Vanda, hi, this is Julia Musto from Fox News. I know we have a short period of time here, so I'll try not to mince words. Uh, I know you have a specific training regimen to follow before you go to space. What will you be doing in the days leading up to April 9th to be prepared um, in terms of both health and, and you know, your, your pre preparedness for the flight that you have been doing this whole time? Well, uh, actually, just yesterday, we finished our final exam as, uh, for activities on the space station. And a couple days prior to that, we finished our final exam for activities on the spacecraft that'll get us to the uh, space station, the Soyuz. So that involved a lot of prep to get ready for those exams. They, those went great, and it's really a good milestone to have behind us. Between now and the actual launch, we'll do a lot to uh, make sure that we're uh, not going to bring anything that shouldn't come up to the space station with us to the space station. So we'll be in quarantine. We'll get monitored every very frequently to make sure that uh, we're staying healthy, and then We'll have time to exercise, relax, uh, walk around outside. I'm going to try to make sure I spend as much time outside as possible while I still have the chance. And uh, mm -hmm. just make sure I have everything in order before we, before we go. So this is going to be a, uh, the next couple of weeks will be, it should be pretty pleasant for us. In addition to that, we will uh, also review a lot of the procedures that we'll be using to actually get to the space station. Uh, we'll do those pretty frequently. Right. So you're a space flight veteran now. How will this adventure differ from uh, previous adventures in terms of uh, the coronavirus pandemic and health and safety measures that are put in place? So certainly the prep, the training has had uh, a big impact from COVID because we've always had to wear masks when we're around other people. But as far as uh, operating on the space station and getting to the space station, it's always been very important for us to protect the space station from any type of disease. So that should be business as usual. Um, of course, while we're in quarantine, we're going to be a little better, a lot better than we had to be before about maintaining social isolation, wearing masks. Um, and then I, th I think compared to previous flights, getting to the space station, I'm expecting the first month on the space station to feel a lot different. I had a lot of adjusting to do, a lot of lessons to learn how to operate in an environment where the way I normally behaved wouldn't work. I lost a lot of things in that first month. It was very frustrating and so many things that I could do without any conscious effort on the ground required me to concentrate completely. So I'm hoping a lot of those lessons I learned will come right back to me and I'll be able to, to start sprinting this time. Yes, sir. So you are set to work on hundreds of different experiments on issues ranging from Alzheimer's to studies on cotton root systems. What can you tell us about your work once you get up there? My, my, I perceive my job as a space station crew member as being like a laboratory technician. There's scientists that put a lot of thought into what experiments they want to get done. They, they're doing the, the data gathering and the data analysis and writing papers. My job is to facilitate that those things work when it's up there. I need to make sure that they have the resources they need. If something needs to be troubleshot, I'll help out with the troubleshooting. Sometimes those scientists will be looking over our shoulder with a video camera and uh, will actually be coaching us on what they want us to do to try to help make things work. And it's uh, interesting work. Mm -hmm. So personal preference kits are largely mysterious. Can you tell us about anything that you intend to bring with you? Well, the most important personal possession that I'm bringing with me is my wedding ring. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it, really. A, a few other things that my wife gave me to uh, give as gifts to, to friends Later on, those, that's the primary things I'm bringing up this time. Copy that. Um, so NASA has this larger goal right now with missions of Art, like Artemis and uh, the Perseverance Mars 2020 rover. Um, in addition, uh, commercial spaceflight has sort of come into the foray here. How do you see this trip playing into the bigger picture? So... When we are on the space station, that's a capability that we need to maintain somehow, but we also want to start having these new capabilities, like you mentioned, with, go, with the Artemis program. It's going to be really hard if we can't do both of those things, all of those things, if all of the burden of that falls on the taxpayer. So having ways where we can facilitate this continued capability to put people in low-Earth orbit, both to do science and to train for longer-duration missions and to learn about how to have people survive on long-duration missions and function well. Um, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we can have that be commercially successful. So I see a big part of my job is helping facilitate 
those commercial successes and uh, just continue to help make progress. I am part of the science experiment my, myself. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I believe that is my time for today and good luck. Thank you very much, Julie. Great talking to you. Great talking with you. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, this is Mark Corot from uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Hello, Mark. Good to hear your voice. Good to hear yours. I've got a few questions here. Um, you know, from your perspective as as a veteran who's flown previously, uh, what is your what is the primary mission focus for your time? Uh, in, including the science and technology uh, and spacewalk objectives. Uh, uh, I understand, I think, from the potential scheduling, you guys could be working on the, the solar array upgrades with the IROSIS and so forth. Um, but I'm just sort of wondering, you know, from your perspective, what's what's at the top? Ooh, what's at the, I don't think I could say what's at the top. I, uh, I, for me, what's at the top is whatever's scheduled for that particular day that I'm preparing for. I definitely, like you mentioned, the solar rays are going to be a big deal, getting those EVAs done to get those in place. That'll be a huge success. Uh, but the primary reason, the, the reason the space station exists and the reason we're going there is the science experiments. It's a very unique place. The space station allows us to do experiments on things that we couldn't ever do on the ground. And so... We want to maximize that capability to make progress both in our ability to further exploration in space, but also to help uh, life on Earth now. There's a wide variety of experience, everything from things that help out with Alzheimer's to, to diabetes. So, uh, or even things like water reclamation. Uh, we learn all kinds of things on the space station with that facility. Do you think um, in that regard that um, this is an investment that will have a long payout. It may take um, maybe decades for a lot of people to understand some of the things you've done and and uh, the time it takes for them to sort of mature and work their way into everyday life. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? I Yes, certainly. I think that's a challenge. Anytime you have things that uh, don't give you immediate results, uh, it takes a big commitment. It takes discipline to want to invest in those things and see them to fruition, but that doesn't make them any less valuable. You, I think you've answered this question a few times this morning and before, um, but how do you prepare yourself uh, to live and work on the space station for six months that you know of, um, but perhaps longer um, is... Is that a challenge that's maybe uh, easier for a veteran than it might be for a first-time astronaut? Or if you're an astronaut, you're an astronaut and you can do all that. 
Oh, I definitely was a different astronaut the first month I was in space compared to the, the second, third, fourth, and fifth month I was in space. I uh, there's a lot of I. I, I certainly have had enough experience with trying to learn habits that I feel pretty confident that if I do something consistently for three weeks, I can make it a habit. There are all kinds of habits that I have for operating on the planet successfully that just did not work on the space station. So I had to develop those new habits, and that took that first month for those to be second nature. I'm hoping when I get back to the space station, I'll just be able to jump right into those same old habits that I learned the previous time and won't have to go through that adaptation process so much. Uh, something I haven't mentioned before, though, as far as uh, living on the space station, I, I really think it's important to pay attention to your psychological, your mental health while you're on the space station, doing an indoor job for months on end. I, that can be trying. And so something that I try to do is spend some time meditating every day and uh, just to, to pay attention, be attentive to uh, where I am, how I'm doing, and uh, how I can uh, continue to operate positively. Well, when you, when you put the long duration potential possibility in in perspective, um, if if you were to spend more than six months, um, I mean even six months, but if you were to spend more, you're making a sort of contribution. I think, uh, as I understand it, to to future human space exploration uh, uh, missions to Mars would be longer. For instance, um, do you have any thoughts about? how that helps uh, prepare for the future? Sure. We, if we're going to travel farther away, it's going to take more time. People are going to have to do longer space flights to do those things. So understanding how the human body reacts is really important. Uh, and, for example, when I came, we, it's not, so right now when we fly to space, we land and there's medical attention available for us immediately. But we're going to send people to Mars they're going to get there and they're going to be explorers. They're going to have to function in no matter what situation, whatever health state they find themselves. We need to make sure that's a health state that's good enough that they can do the things they need to do to continue to survive and succeed with the mission. So I'm very happy to uh, provide more data on how the human body reacts to being in a, a free fall for such an extended period of time while we're in orbit or on the way to some other place. Why is it sort of important to go with an open mind? Um, you certainly, from the comments and the questions you've answered on whether you'll be there six months or longer, uh, just seem prepared to adapt. Is, is is that you, or is that the uh, astronaut culture? Uh, is there any way to sort of explain that? I I think uh, in this type of environment that we're in as astronauts, it's probably going to enhance your chances of of feeling happy about things. If you keep your expectations flexible, if you recognize that maybe you maybe you don't want to be in space for a really long time, or maybe you have one preference versus the other, but you got to recognize that you don't know. You might be surprised that there's some benefits to the things that you'd prefer not to do. So I try to just recognize that whatever path I end up on, I I, I have to choose which lens I'm going to look at those things through, and. It's just something I got taught as a kid by my, my, my mom and dad, that uh, we get to choose that lens. And if you can choose to be grumpy about things, or you can choose to find the thing to be happy about. It's a choice we get to make as human beings. The um, trajectory for your launch is uh, quick, two orbits, about three hours. Um, is that desirable for an astronaut um, more than, say, a longer, more traditional uh time to take from the ground to the space station? So my previous flight took six hours, and uh, prior to that, there was, most of the flights were two days. And I don't think we had a real strong consensus on whether or not people preferred the six hours versus the two days. Uh, the, the six hours was quite exhausting because even getting to the launch pad and getting suited up was multiple hours before then, so it ended up being a very long day. So I think I'm going to be very happy with a three-hour to get to the space station trip. I think that'll feel much less uh, fatiguing than the six-hour trip would have taken. Uh, the two-day trip that we've had in the past actually involved time to sleep, but the uh, six-hour trip did not involve uh, any, any rest periods. Uh, this time it's going to be so quick, hopefully, that uh, I won't need any, I won't even feel tired. We'll see.
Mark, thanks for a little bit of your time and welcome to Trek Time. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for a little bit of your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, you obviously have a job to do and you have a training to support you, but how do you prepare for launching into orbit and spend uh, such a long duration on the space station? Did you say, how do I prepare mentally for that? Yeah. Oh, I think you just have to uh, pay attention to your mental health. I think uh, for me, st spending some time meditating every day, um, trying to figure out uh, ways to help out other people is a great way for me to feel happy with myself. So just having a sense of service about every day and uh, trying to feel like you, you have a way to contribute to the, the rest of the group that's useful will go a long way towards making it a, a very enjoyable time period for me. They're going to be flight engineers for this launch aboard Soyuz. What does that entail? Uh, in the right seat as a flight engineer, my responsibilities are really just to back up the, the what I would call the commander and the co-pilot. I, I uh, have access to the data about the spacecraft and training to understand what it means. So when I see something that looks at it like it's off nominal, with, out of sorts, I'll just raise to the attention of the commander and the co-pilot that, hey, this could use some more attention if I notice it before them. And then uh, we'll work through the whole process together. But they'll definitely be the ones taking charge. It sounds absolutely incredible. One thing I would love to do is jump aboard a Soyuz, any rocket, uh, and head into space. Uh, once you get there, a short uh, trip to the International Space Station, relatively speaking, of course. Uh, and then you're going to be spending a few months at the station. What are your objectives for this expedition? My primary objective, like every other uh, flight engineer on the space station, is to facilitate the science experiments that are happening on board every day. There's hundreds of them, and uh, I like to refer to myself as a laboratory technician up there, facilitating the experiments on behalf of the scientists that can't be there with us. Well, this is going to be your second trip to the station, having completed four months as part of Expedition 53 in 1718. Were there any lessons from those four months that you're going to apply this time around? Anything you learned uh, on the station? Yeah, I, I would say I learned a lot the first month I was in orbit about how to perform better. Uh, lots of little things. Um, just managing things that can all float away from you is important. Even, I guess, kind of a funny story. Uh, I was the only rookie on my space on the space station when I got up there. And the first time I opened up a, a bag of rice, all the rest of my crewmates started saying, wait, wait, wait. And I just tore open that bag of rice, and the rice grains went flying all over the place. I now know that if I'm going to open something like that, I need to put some olive oil or garlic paste in there to serve as food glue so it all stays together and I can get it from my spoon into my mouth before it flies all over the place. A little bit like Homer Simpson aboard the space shuttle in that episode of The Simpsons with the back. <laughs> what about personally, Mark? Do you, is there a moment, or do you have moments where you can just stop and look around you and, and see where you are uh, floating high above the Earth to, to look down uh, on the Earth and know that everyone is, is down there? Uh, do, you, do you have that sort of downtime um, to just contemplate everything? Yes, uh, definitely. Weekends are primarily off time. We have a lot of house clean to do on those, on, uh, just like a lot of us do, do our errands on Saturday mornings maybe. But I love looking out the window. In fact, my first orbit around the planet after I got to the space station, we were supposed to go to sleep right away, but I could not get myself to go to bed right away. I, I was just so excited. And I spent the first 90 minutes on the space station staring out the window. It, it's just indescribably beautiful. Um, it looks so close, but I could look I could look at the entire peninsula of Italy in one in one glance when I was up there. So it's it's the scale is just hard to get your head wrapped around. Well, with Crew Dragon about to enter mainstream services, NASA's way into space. Do you think launches on the Soyuz will be missed? I hope that we continue to uh, operate on multiple spacecraft. It's just, it gives us redundancy. And as more commercial companies are successful with that, then I hope we trade uh, those seats back and forth so that we can uh, 
continue to cooperate, uh, give them more, re give the Russians more redundancy by using our spacecraft and uh, continue to have that skill set uh, with that I have right now to, to launch on a, as a crew member on a Russian spacecraft. Fantastic, Mark. Well, thanks for a little bit of your time. Good luck on the expedition. Uh, really looking forward to uh, seeing uh, everything unfold for you. Thanks very much. Great talking to you today. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, from Matt at Trexo in Australia. Thanks very much, Mark. You have a good one.
Good morning. How are we doing, Mark? Good morning. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Hey, first things first. Sorry, I didn't hear your question. Oh, I think I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm so sorry, Mark. Um, can I get you to say and spell your first and last name and tell me your title? Sure. My first name is Mark, M-A-R-K. My last name is Van de Hei. That's uh, V as in Victor, A-N, D as in Delta, E, space H-E-I. And I'm a NASA astronaut. Okay, Mark, talk to me about how you became an astronaut as a former Johnny. Oh, gosh. Uh, as a, uh, so, well, uh, certainly the requirements for becoming an astronaut involve that you have now a master's degree. So getting an undergraduate degree from St. John's was certainly a step towards getting that master's degree. And uh, I learned a lot about just being a good human being and uh, being a, a contributing member of a team by... Uh, the culture that uh, St. John's encourages. So talk to me a little bit about what you're going to be doing when you head up to the space station on, on the 9th. So every crew member on the space station is a flight engineer, but the way I like to describe that is you're basically a laboratory technician. The space station has a unique capability to allow us to do science experiments that we can't do on the Earth. and. Those science experiments are designed by scientists who are going to do the, the observations and data analysis and write the papers to help us advance our understanding of how to, to progress. And my job is to facilitate those, the success of those experiments. So we'll uh, make sure the experiments have the resources they need. We'll uh, install experiments sometimes. We'll uh, troubleshoot them as need, when needed as well. So sometimes the uh, scientists will actually look over our shoulders using video and talk, talk us through what they want us to do. Other times, we just pull out a procedure that's scheduled for us to perform and, and go for it. So it's my understanding you're going to be doing some, some Alzheimer's research as well as sort of using a portable ultrasound. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, the, um, real quickly about the Alzheimer's. Gosh, I'm trying to remember the details. Um, there's, I, if I remember correctly, there's an understanding of how substances move through cells um, that will help potentially help out with uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Is um, There's experiments associated with that that are easier to do in space because when we try to do them on the ground, the containers for the substances are actually uh, confuse the science. In space, you don't need the container. You, things can just float and the, the predominant force becomes the uh, surface tension. So you end up with a pure experiment. You have less complicating factors. You can get a, a better understanding of how things actually work that way. Just fascinating stuff that you'd never never really think of. Okay, so two, follow, two questions for you. How long are you going to be up there? Oh, okay. How long will you be up there? Sorry, I guess we have to wrap. Oh, I'll be up in space. I'm assigned to a six-month flight. It's a dynamic operation, though, so uh, whatever time they tell me I need to stay is the time I'm prepared to stay. Mark, well, we appreciate you so much, and best of luck to you out there. Enjoy it. Thanks very much. I'm sure I will. Great talking to you. You too. Have a good one.
Good morning, Mark. This is Marcia Dunn from the AP speaking with you from Kennedy Space Center. Um, I, I still can't get over the thought that you may be flying in space for a solid year. I'm, I'm just wondering, in case that happens, are there any changes in what you're taking up into space with you, how you're thinking, and what about your wife, Julie, and two kids? What do they think about you being uh, off the planet potentially for so long? Well, the primary plan is still six months, but uh, we're trying to be, make sure we're ready for anything. Honestly, six months is a long time, too. So I, I think the same mindset you take with a long-duration flight of six months um, is something you need to carry forward for the year. I think the thing for me that I'm going to have to focus on is just that one day, not not focus so much on um, the length of time ahead of me, but honestly, I'm so excited about getting up to space again right now. The idea of if, if it were to be longer than six months, I don't know how it's going to feel after five and a half months. But right now, if it ended up being longer than six months, that just sounds like a, a bonus. Well, I, I know the last time you flew, um, you ended up taking your rosary and even some hose for Holy Communion. Uh, last time you had a got to chat with the Pope. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen again, but tell me about that. Are those still in your plans so that you can um, take part in Mass as you can in orbit? Gosh, I really um, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, answering that because I, I have not arranged for those things to be in place this time. Well, that's okay. I, I was just curious. And, and tell me, um, if you're up there for a year, you're probably going to uh, welcome the, the Russian movie people and even the Axiom crew to the space station. What's your thought about space tourists, non-professional astronauts visiting not just the space station, but flying in space like the Inspiration4? The Europeans are looking for astronauts with physical um, disabilities. Uh, what's your take on all that? Well, space flight is an amazing opportunity for any human being and I think the larger swath of humanity we can get to participate in that is just going to be a benefit to humanity. Also, we want to be able to continue to operate in low Earth orbit like we have been for so many years. But we also want to pro progress and get back to the moon. So going in a direction where we can get low Earth orbit operations to continue without being a burden on the taxpayer is a huge success for us. So if we can get commercial enterprises to be successful, then that's exactly what we have to do. So everything I can do to help facilitate that is uh, the right thing to do. Would you feel bothered by having people visiting on the space station while you're trying to get work done and, and they're making movies or, like, you know, uh, doing the touristy kind of stuff? I, I just wondered what that would be like from a working point of view. I think it's going to depend a lot on the individuals. Uh, you could have individuals that are in that situation that could just be an absolute joy to have on the space station with you. And if it's a, a troublesome personality, that could be challenging. I, quite honestly, that's just the way humans work. I think uh, anytime you're doing an expedition, whether it be uh, into, uh, into Antarctica or climbing Mount Everest, the interpersonal skills that people have have a bigger impact on the success of the mission sometimes than the technical skills people have. So my hope is that the people we send to the space station have good enough interpersonal skills that uh, we'll, we'll actually enjoy having them up there, and it'll be a pleasure to share that environment with them. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned last week that you got your clothes up there, at least, since you're sort of a substitute. Um, I'm wondering, what about your menu? Are you going to have to eat food that was picked by a Russian cosmonaut for six months or more, or, or how did that work? Did you have any individual choice in what you're going to be eating? Actually, my perception, at least, is that I got the same choices that I would have gotten had I uh, um, known well in advance that I was definitely going to be on this flight. Uh, NASA does a really good job of being prepared for all contingencies, and the primary uh, menu for all astronauts is the same. We do get a few, I can't remember the current, current terminology for it, but we get some crew choice con type containers where we get a, just to add a little bit of variety. And uh, honestly, the Russian food is pretty good. So if I ended up with a lot of Russian food that I did not expect to get, that would not be a bad deal. Uh, and my last question for you before I sign off, what's the lure of space travel for you? What, what is it that you find so appealing, why you devote your life to that? And, and good luck to you. 
Oh, thanks very much, Marcia. Uh, great question. So the initial appeal was definitely the combination of mental and physical challenges. Uh, but as, as time went on, it really is the opportunity to serve. It's, it's a job with a really strong sense of purpose where I, could, I feel like I'm contributing in a way that's very meaningful. And I think that's what all of us want out of our work is that we feel like we're spending such a big part of our life and doing something that matters. And that's certainly something that I feel like I get from this job. Also, the opportunity to get a different perspective on what it means to be a human being and to, to get a very unique, unique perspective on our planet that's so precious to us and the atmosphere that we rely on so much. Well, Godspeed and good luck, Mark. Thanks, Mark, sir. Hello? Oh my god, is this on this line? I'm getting nothing but static. Uh, on on my one line I'm okay. But Oh. Good good morning. This is Owen Mugen from the News of Shepard Smith. You spent nearly six months up on the ISS. What was your single biggest takeaway from the experience? My single biggest takeaway from being on the space station for six months was uh, 
a perspective of the atmosphere of the Earth uh, from this when you compare the, the the depth of the Earth's atmosphere to the size of the Earth, it seems like it's just a thin varnish. So it really changed my perspective of what it means when I'm standing on the surface of the Earth looking up into space. It doesn't feel like I'm separate from space, even on the surface of the Earth. It's just not a lot that keeps you dif- di- uh, apart from the vacuum of space. That's amazing. How long did it take you to get your Earth leg back once you were home? So I like to think it took me a couple of weeks, but uh, my, I've seen my wife roll her eyes at me a few times. It might have taken more like a month. Um, I certainly had some lingering effects. Uh, sir, I remember being pretty grumpy every time I bent over to tie my shoes because my lower back was bothering me a lot. Uh, there were some very severe effects that went away within 24 hours. I, I uh, Just walking in a straight line was hard at first. Um, but it, that, the human body is very adaptable, and things started coming back really quickly. Right. You know, talk about being an experiment. You're being an experiment yourself in a way. The impact of all the space time on your body is going to be watched very closely on this coming mission. Uh, yeah, that's certainly true. There's all kinds of things we're learning about how to uh, maintain the human body for extended periods in space, which is important if we're going to continue to try to uh, explore further and further into the solar system. I, uh, But there's also experiments we're doing where we're learning about things like, for example, osteoporosis, because we've got people that, uh, like me, I lost 7% of my bone density on my previous flight, and I was able to get it all back. So learning how to better maintain bone density has has benefits not just for space exploration, but also for uh, people on Earth today. Great. Now, your time aboard the ISS might double if a film crew heads up in the fall. Psychologically speaking, how do you prepare yourself for your year on the ISS? And, and And can you compare that experience to the isolation many of us have felt down here at Earth during the pandemic? That's interesting. I've never thought about that uh, comparison before, but I do think uh, the response we've had to take to COVID to isolate ourselves more does get you closer to feel like what it's like being on a, on a space station where you don't get to interact with people as much. Uh, if that lasts for six months or a year, I think the important thing is to just focus on the day you're on and not, not uh, if you're really excited about every day in the future, then sure, focus on the excitement of those upcoming days but you don't want to end up in a space where you're dreading this long period of time ahead of you um, when you probably could be quite happy if you just focus on the satisfaction of getting your job done on that particular day. And then just, just like we'd normally do, just keep plugging along. And next thing you know, a year or six months like it's planned for me right now, um, whatever time it ends up being will be something that just went by quickly. Great. Thank you very much. Godspeed, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Great talking to you. Okay. All right. You too. Bye-bye.
Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, the crew member, and on up into the Soyuz spacecraft. Motion. And this view from uh, Randy Bresnik's helmet camera as he uh, watches the handiwork of his spacewalking partner, Mark Van de Heij. Depart the pattern, head back to the airlock, and then no three. Three. Uh, hope I don't need anything. All right.
Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, the crew member, and on up into the Soyuz spacecraft. Motion. And this view from uh, Randy Bresnik's helmet camera as he uh, watches the handiwork of his spacewalking partner, Mark Van de Heij. Departure pattern, head back to the 
Copy your lock and then no three. Three. Uh, nope, I don't need anything. All right. Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, the crew member, and on up into the Soyuz spacecraft.
motion. And this view from uh, Randy Bresnik's helmet camera as he uh, watches the handiwork of his spacewalking partner, Mark Van de Heij. Depart the pattern, head back to your lock, and then no three. Three. Uh, hope I don't need anything. All right. Yeah. Dude, Mark, Mark. Yeah. Oh, thanks a lot.